בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. שבוע טוב, שבוע מבורך. We're uh, continuing our series of the Jewish השקפה, based on the uh, ספר אמונה וביטחון by the חזון איש. Uh, tonight's שיעור will be for a uh, רפואה שלמה for רבנית לבנה בת שרה, רב אפרים בן שולמית, רבנית שרה בת ענת, uh, אבי מורי דוד בן עשריה, אמי מורתי דוריס בת ז'ורה. Uh, and also for a atzlacha uh, raba for uh, Marsha bat Julie, Ayla bat Marsha, Samuel bat Marsha, Sephas bat Marsha, Alexander bat Marsha, Louis bat Marsha, and all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahides that continue to contribute their time, their efforts, uh, and anything that they can to, uh, and also watch our shiurim most importantly. More than anything else, we uh, appreciate people learning our Torah, more than, uh, more than money, more than efforts, more than anything else, simply because we know that's one of the ways that a person can stay connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and if they give us the merit to uh, be the, uh, the, the vessel where you learn the Torah from that, it's even better than anything else that you can get. Now, um, the Chazon Ish has been uh, teaching us the, uh, about the, the issues that we have in every generation, and needless to say in ours, uh, the, the, the moral bankruptcy that we uh, live in today has uh, become apparent to everyone uh, but, uh, you know, some people are actually content with it. They, uh, they like the moral bankruptcy. They like the world the way it is. And, of course, there are some people out there that say that this is not a world. This is a, uh, this is a disaster. People even have come to me with questions of whether they should have kids and bring kids to the world, you know, considering the fact that uh, there's so much disaster in the world. And uh, one of the things that uh, you'll learn, that the more you learn Torah and uh, the more you learn his- history, real history along with it is that there's nothing new under the sun everything that we have in the world today has already already been here everything is already you know everything that's happening today has happened in the past and uh, there's really nothing that's actually new out there and yet Am Yisrael continue to uh, to fight for their survival to fight for their Torah to fight for their children to stay from to stay connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. and it's only because of those people that continued fighting for the sake of the Torah, that we still have a nation and that we still have a world. But whether it's the uh, uh, disgusting abominations that are roaming the streets and doing parades like the gay pride parades, or the uh, what people think is an upgrade uh, to the disaster of the uh, homosexuals that simply take the neck, the initiative to change their gender. All of these things are mentioned in the Torah. You have a, uh, the uh, Zohar Kadosh talks about how the generation of Noah was destroyed because of homosexuality getting to the point where it became uh, uh, legal in a sense that they gave a ketuba for a man to marry a man and a, a woman to marry a woman and even they uh, Ibn Ezra writes 800 years ago that there were people in his time needless to say in previous generations that would actually do uh, sex change uh, surgeries so this is not a new thing just the, the, the process perhaps has changed but uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the abominations of the world have not changed. That's always been here. And until Mashiach comes, it's always going to be here. But the, the reality is, is that most people, when they look at the, uh, the teachings like this, when they look at Musar and they, they get uh, a real conversation, uh, one of the things that some of us forget uh, is that really the whole lecture is for you. Meaning, it's not for you to look at the wrong in others. Uh, because that's pretty apparent and it's really not a chidush and it's definitely not a uh, show of brilliance that you can notice the uh, the flaws in others. The key is to see which parts of the conversations relate to you personally. And many times I, uh, I see that there are certain lectures that I hope they're going to affect you know, one person or another or you see simply you had a lecture about something and somebody that uh, you know sends you a question exactly about what you talked about during that lecture two or three days later or a few hours later and you say wait a minute just watch the lecture and and you'll see the answer and sometimes people are you know gonna you know say yes and they watch and they say thank you very much but other times they simply just oh okay thanks and you know I was hoping for a shorter answer to my problem or the worst is they watch the lecture but they don't see the answer why because they don't see 
the problem in themselves. They don't actually see what the root of the problem is. They just figure that there's a different answer. Perhaps it's somebody else's responsibility. My problems are somebody else's responsibility. And this is actually the reason why the Gemara in Masechet Chulin and in many other places in the Torah talks about how a person is obligated to see the deficiency in himself. In fact, a Talmit Chacham is uh, not considered a Talmit Chacham unless he can identify his own treif. Unless he identifies the treif that he has. So the question is, you know, why does that make him a Talmit Chacham? I mean, there could be people that are not necessarily Torah scholars. They're not Talmid Chachamim. And, but they've learned the halachot of shechita, uh, of how to slaughter and how to identify what's taref, what's not, you know, how the lungs are supposed to look, and, uh, and so on. If he learned that, does that make him a, uh, a, and he can identify what's taref, what's not, does that make him a Talmid Chacham? No. So why does a Talmid Chacham need to know how to identify taref or not? So the Gemara and the Mepharshim explain it's not necessarily the taref that is just in a cow, but rather the, the fact that he owns it. The fact that he owns it and he can still remove his own bias and see that this problem belongs to him. This issue belongs to him because the traditional person that's out there, the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says, an adam roi chova be'atzmo. A person does not see the deficiency in himself. So many times when people look at Musar lectures, you'll see that they like it, they appreciate it, and they can tell you 15 different people in their life that have the problems that were mentioned in the last few lectures. And they can tell you, yeah, all of these lectures, it has to do with my husband. All of these lectures, my children should definitely watch them. All of these lectures, my mother-in-law, for sure, if she, if she watched them, she'd change her life. Need, you know, little do they know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu made them watch it because the lecture has to do with them, not necessarily just everybody else. It could very well help everybody else, but the reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu literally restructured the world in order to make sure that you watch it is because you need to actually listen to it and you need to actually learn from it. And the same thing goes for the speaker. You need to be the one that speaks it because you need to be the one that reflects over all of these issues to see where you stand. And one of the main things that people do not do is actually reflect. Reflect as much at least as they need to. And you know the reason why I say that Hashem has to restructure the world in order for us to have the merit to see a real, a real conversation that has to do with real Torah is because in the world today, it's a abundance of information. Literally, in a press of a button, a person can land in Geinom or in Gan Eden. One button. Take a phone, press a certain button. That button is either going to get you to the worst sites in the world, full of filth, full of pornography, full of Abu Dazara, full of heresy, full of nonsense, and simply person becomes addicted to this garbage and ruins his life or like one guy that likes to listen to a lot of different speakers like people like to uh, choose sauce for for their salads on monday it's this on tuesday it's that and on wednesday it's something else you know some people like to watch speakers like that they change they change around different things and the last speaker he got hooked up on for the last six or seven months has helped him so much that he now has a gambling uh, a new gambling uh, uh, addiction so of course Today, when you actually wake up in the morning and you say, you thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and you thank Him for everything, and then you say the blessings of the Torah, one of the things you have to really have kavanah on is the blessings of the Torah. Because if you're going to press a button, or you're going to open a book, or you're going to buy something out there that has to do with Torah, you really have to pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that it's actually real Torah, and not one of these heretical speakers that's out there that's going to tell you that Hashem loves you no matter what, Mashiach is going to save everybody, and all types of mumbo-jumbo that people create on a regular basis. And unfortunately, people fall for it. So it's important for us to know that any time, any time a Kadosh Baruch Hu brings us real Torah to our desk, it has to do with us first, everyone else second. Everyone else second. But the priority always has to be on us. And this is one of the things that the Chazanish has been focusing on over the last several shiurim, where he's talking about how a person treats Talmidei Chachamim. What is their perspective 
of these Talmidei Chachamim, whether these Talmidei Chachamim are Dayanim at the local Bedin, or they're the local rabbi, or they're the rabbi that actually helped you do tshuva, or get chizuk, or it's just a Torah scholar that, uh, that's somewhere that you're uh, benefiting from, or it's one of the G'dolei Ado. How do you treat these people? And one of the main things that we learned from the Chazonish is that a Talmid Chacham, someone that's actually a Torah scholar, that learns Torah, and this is what they spend their lives doing, this is what their priority number one is, has to have a completely separate uh, treatment from the rest of society. Why? He may look like a human being, but he's an angel among men. And of course, this is one of the things that people don't like to uh, uh, accept because many times the rabbis, especially the local rabbis that they spend a lot of time with, befriend them in such a fashion that they figure, oh, he's a rabbi, he's my boy, he's my friend, he's my buddy. So, you know, I could say no, I could say yes, I can give him high fives, I can give him a hug. You know, he's like family. And they forget that this rabbi may very well be a real Talmud Chacham. Now, he may not be a Talmud Chacham, he may have just a title just because that's his job. But if he's a real Talmud Chacham and you, you giving him a, 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 a high five and treating him like he's one of your boys is one of the worst mistakes you can make in your life. Why? Because once you befriend somebody, it becomes much easier for you to simply insult them and treat them like you would anybody else, even if that anybody else is somebody that cuts you off in the highway and you have a few words to say about his mother. So it's important for a person to know that the Talmud Chachamim they have they're of a different breed and it's not that they were born different they simply worked on themselves throughout their life for an extended period of time a lot of toil a lot of effort a lot of sacrifice in order to acquire torah that is literally rewiring their spiritual network rewiring their spiritual nervous system in such a fashion that they literally have a more direct connection with akadosh Baruch Hu, and perhaps even get to a point where they're First uh, opinion is da Torah. That's their natural opinion. Their natural opinion is what the, what the Torah says. So when a person has such a mindset, uh, he, he's obviously not like everybody else because everybody else simply treats things based on whatever their logic says. Whatever their logic says and the natural logic of a person is typically the opposite of Torah. Why? Because this is what where the Yetzirah comes in. So now... The uh, tendency of a person is to judge everybody the same way that they view themselves, meaning that if he sees that this is a crime that he would make, he therefore naturally accuses or suspects everybody else of doing it. This is one of the reasons why when people get, let's say, for example, they go to a Bedin, they have a court case, a Jewish court case, with another uh, a person, and they lose the case. If they are not people that have a emunat chachamim, you know, faith in our sages, faith in our Torah, at least a, a, a shaykhut, a connection to the Torah, to the point where they accept the deen, not just because a, uh, uh, they don't want to uh, go into cherem uh, uh, in the community, and uh, but rather because they believe that whatever the rabbis decided, this is it and they have a Torah and they know what they're talking about. Many times people that don't know, typically they, uh, they feel like the rabbis made a mistake. Rabbis made a mistake because of X, Y, Z. Maybe the rabbi didn't understand because he's not a businessman. Maybe the rabbi didn't understand because he has a bias. Maybe the rabbi didn't understand because perhaps I didn't speak clearly enough. Or maybe the other guy was a better speaker than me and he spoke better. Maybe his witnesses were better and all types of other things. And many times they start suspecting the rabbis of wrongdoing or bias, which literally destroys the Torah. And that's actually one of the things that you see in the world today, that where you see people that listen to Musal from real speakers that speak the Torah, from time to time, you'll see in the books, you'll see in the speeches, how the sages go and expose another sage or another chacham, and sometimes someone that pretends to be a chacham. And they go after them and they actually do, they have a big battle over it. At times it was between two tzaddikim, at other times it was between the tzaddikim versus the reshaim. 
even though sometimes the Rishayim were also scholars and were also very, very smart, but they pull wool over people's eyes. And this actually happened many times throughout history. One of the most notable cases, anyone that wants to read up about it, is the case of Shabtai Tzvi, Imach Shimo Vizicho. Shabtai Tzvi and also his followers that uh, literally tortured the Jewish world for hundreds of years, hundreds of years because of what happened from not only him, but also the, uh, the people that continued his, uh, uh, um, his teachings and so on. This tortured Am Yisrael for literally a few generations, but this was not coming from ignoramuses like the people that are running rampant in the world today that don't know their Aleph bed, but they decide they know what God thinks and what God needs. Rather, these people were actually Torah scholars that knew a lot, knew a lot more than just uh, uh, what we think is even a lot, and they were able to still put a wool over people's eyes. Same goes with the uh, people, uh, Yerovam ben Nevat, at the time of David Melech, you had a, uh, several Achitofel, Doeg, these were the heads of the Sanhedrin. Korach went against Moshe Rabenu. these were great people. Some of them had, like Korach had Ruach HaKodesh, Korach saw that from him, Shmuel and Navi is going to come. And the Gemara says Shmuel was like Moshe and Aaron. So Korach saw Begloch HaKodesh that Shmuel is going to come from him. Little did he know that it's going to come from his children because his children are going to do tshuva before, before uh, being, being swallowed by Gehenom like he did. But he thought that since Shmuel is going to come from him, surely whatever comes out of his mouth is kosher. So Korach at one point was a very righteous person that had Ruach HaKodesh, some even say prophecy. But Korach went against Hashem. Korach went against, against Hashem's servant, Moshe Rabenu. Doeg, Achitofel, Yerovam ben Nevat, these were great people that knew an extraordinary amount of Torah. The Gemara says that uh, Yerovam ben Nevat was able to give over a hundred interpretations for the Torah. Literally, things that were unbelievable. Unbelievable. Each one of these people were heads of the Sanhedrin, heads of their communities. They were great people, but yet they went against the Torah. They were big chachamim, but their ego got in the way. So we see here that at times you have people fighting these people, and it looks like, wait a minute, he's a chacham, he's a chacham. So I could just pick whichever chacham I want, and uh, you know, or not pick anybody. If both chachamim are fighting, then you know what? I'll just be my own chacham. And this is not the way of Torah. The way of Torah is to always want to chase the emet and to see where is the flaw. Where is the flaw? Where is the da'at Torah and where is not? And this is one of the things that's an obligation on us, an obligation on us in every single generation to always chase what is the opinion of a Torah and not necessarily what is the opinion that is meeting my, uh, my desires, that is allowing me and enabling me to continue being the way that I already am without requiring me to change. So it's important for us to always understand that when it comes to the books, the history of different people fighting against each other, whether it's today or in a previous generation, it is always important for us to see where is the Torah when it comes to this particular talk or this particular conversation. What does the Torah say about it? If one side has Torah sources and the other side does not have Torah sources, already that makes the argument a lot easier for you to decide on. Why? Because you see, this one has Torah backing it, the other one does not. The other one has maybe a clever tongue, maybe a, a few good jokes, but no Torah behind it. On the other hand, when you have Torah sources on both sides, you have to see which ones do the other Gedoleado side with. And you'll see that there's the clarification becomes more and more apparent as a person investigates further. But to do all of this, we are required to introspect. We are required ourselves to investigate, are we leaning towards one side over the other? Do we really want him to win? Do we want him to win? Do we want somebody to win or do we just want to stick to the truth? If he wins, then I can stay the same. If the other guy wins, I have to change. So sometimes it's our own bias that is actually creating that war in our mind. That bias that we have because we want him to win because that guy doesn't tell me I have to change. He's the guy that tells me that God owes me everything rather than me owing everything to God. On the other hand, the other guy says that I have to serve God like a slave nonstop and simply pray for Hashem to forgive me for all the sins that I've made. And for that, a Kadosh Baruch will give me all the reward in this world and the next. But yeah, but that requires a lot of work. I'd rather just get it easy on the first guy. 
so a person that is going to do that real introspection on themselves not on their spouse not on their kids not on their best friend not on their mother-in-law or father-in-law but rather on themselves is going to be able to connect to the truth much easier without necessarily having as many bumps but of course each and every single one of us has to know our own flaws has to know our own treif our own non-kosher stuff that's within us to know where where we're leaning towards and to double check if that lean is actually towards a personal bias an agenda that we have or it's towards the Torah itself so now the Chazonish is continuing here after telling us that the sages are of a different breed they literally have a uh, a different metric system for themselves and he compares it to how bribery in the world has a certain spiritual strength that comes from the pro uh, from the place of tuma that literally anytime there is a bribe that automatically creates a spiritual damage that blinds even the, the wise people even the wise people this is the reason why people that have yirat shamayim people that are you know the, the sages that have and chachamim of your generation or perhaps even your community that have real yirat shamayim they run away from from all things that have anything to do with bribery why because they know that the second they take something that could be even viewed as bribery automatically their judgment of you and whatever has to do with you is going to be biased this is why Shlomo Melech says, a person that hates gifts will live, live in this world and live in the next world. So with that being said, the, uh, the, these very same Chachamim that Chazoni says, that because they're so scared, they're so scared of having a bias, they have a different metric systems for themselves, where they are much more stringent when it comes to what they consider a bribe and what they consider is not so even though the letter of the law says a bribery that's actually a uh, some type of a transaction something that is a uh, has to do with a court case and so on but they even considered a a, a, a uh, incidental favor meaning if uh, their uh, guy that's uh, going to be in their court is supposed to be in their court later on that day but it happens to be that that day or day before he uh brought their groceries a little earlier and that's made their life a little easier in their eyes that's already considered a bribe that they have to recuse themselves from the case now again lacha doesn't require that but again the yirat shamayim does so the chazoni says so just like the power was given to bribery to blind the wise so too the power was given to what is considered bribery to the pious person to, to blind him he knows exactly what could blind them even if it's something that the average person would look at and says what's the problem he just delivered his groceries so with that being said he continued last week and said that the torah that when the torah was uh gave uh, uh was given to a person uh and gave a person the right to judge and to rule meaning that person learned enough torah in order to know how to paskin in order to know how to arrive at Allah in matters pertaining to the daily runnings of the world it's a great holocaust when people feel permitted to suspect him unfairly now this is something that is very very common today where it's always been the case throughout history but nonetheless today with the internet and how quickly people shoot their opinion on the internet whatever their opinion is and what they are understanding is and where they want themselves heard they need to get themselves heard and all these blog posts and comments unfortunately the internet while being a great vessel to help people learn to lie and have access to a lot of good a lot of uh, a lot of good information it's also a vessel for a lot of people to uh unfortunately destroy their own ulamaba with their keyboard and many times a person that uh, does not check themselves does not really uh, question why the why behind their comment before they actually write the comment the why before uh, and the purpose before they write that blog post of that article many times people write things or do things on the internet that are going to cost them a lot more than they can imagine they insult a chacham they write a comment and sometimes even do something that they don't even think is such a big deal they don't even think it's such a big deal such as thinking listen I think the rabbi was wrong perhaps the rabbi doesn't understand that we the Ashkenazim or we the Sfaradim or we the Hasidim and so on 
have such and such and such in essence they question that rabbi's knowledge or or, or that rabbi's a uh, agenda or that rabbi's bias and automatically assume he doesn't know and this is a very big problem if you do that publicly now if you have a question and you send that question to the rabbi that's one thing it's private it's one by one no problem but once you make something public it has an altogether different value altogether different meaning hence the reason why it's very very important for people to really try to refrain not from from not making comments simply just don't make comments on the internet not good not bad why because you're more likely to uh, to fall for that trap if you are a regular at the commenting if you're constantly commenting on different videos oh this one was great that one was terrible this one is stupid this one is that it's you're bound to eventually make a mistake that's going to be very very costly but again the uh, the, the wise person will listen and while the others will simply say yeah no that's too much i have to comment i need myself to be heard i need uh, to to have an exchange my family's on facebook my family is on twitter wherever it is people develop these digital families and forget about their real family sometimes anyway the uh the chazonish continues he says that the musar teachings are very stringent when it comes to moral corruption and warn against condemning others even in one's thoughts as if those thoughts were fire worse yet speaking such thoughts even if they're true and all the more so if they're not true that's even worse and if a person is being condemned is a torah scholar then it's a case of defaming a torah scholar which puts the person doing so in the category of an apikos heretic so this is the first section there's a second section which gives the example the example of what this person is doing this person that is in essence not just questioning the torah scholar but worse yet decides to think negatively about this torah scholar why he thinks that the torah scholar has a bias lack of knowledge an agenda of some kind he's treating him like everybody else or perhaps even worse and he went from either he's thinking about it as in in the chazoni says these thoughts are even forbidden as if those thoughts were fire but needless to say it's bad if he speaks it or writes it on the internet which is much more common and even if the thoughts were true it's still prohibited needless to say if they're not true because then it's a different law then it's a chilut. now if this person that you are condemning is a torah scholar you have a very serious problem why because that comment that you made on the internet or in a conversation in your synagogue where you told everybody that you don't really think that the rabbi's lectures are any good maybe we should all go to a different synagogue or you don't think that the uh, rabbi really follows everything he talks about in the lecture and maybe we should you know not necessarily take everything at face value take it with a grain of salt and all types of other stupidity that comes out of people's mouth when they don't know uh that what's coming out of the mouth is literally vomit uh the reality is that when you speak against chachamim you literally with your own hands with your own hands you're putting yourself in the category of a heretic a apikos and this is the language of the of the chazonish this is not uh, something that uh, I'm, I'm adding uh, flavor to this is the language of the chazonish because this is what the gemara paskets someone that uh, goes against chachamim condemns chachamim disrespects them simply is an apikos unfortunately today making fun of Talmidei uh, Chachamim has become, unfortunately, a uh, uh, standard for some people. Standard. And some people are so far that they don't even realize that they're doing it. They simply do it on a regular basis. Yeah, he's good. It's too bad that, uh, you know, he's... Uh, what, what? What's too bad for what? What's too bad? No, no, it's just too bad that he, uh, you know, he's, he looks at the girls. You know, what? what do you mean? all of a sudden they start creating stuff if it's true if it's not true doesn't make a difference because the reality is that whatever they're sharing 
they're not sharing in order to elevate this person they're sharing it in order to destroy that person and they're in, in that process they're destroying not just the person that they spoke about they're destroying themselves and they're destroying the listener if he believes them or she believes them so when when a person talks against chachamim they're literally destroying themselves it's spiritual suicide it's spiritual suicide and unfortunately today as i'm sure some of you have seen in the comments and some of the videos that we have you'll see literally some people even consider themselves rabbis or chassidim or all types of religious people but they feel perfectly fine going and writing things that are should, are not even allowed to be said about anybody needless to say about a rabbi needless to say about someone that sacrifices their life uh needless to say about somebody as great as let's say uh, as as Ephraim, if you see some of the comments on his channel some of the reshaim that are there simply they consider themselves religious but in the same time they talk worse than nazis why because they figured that if whatever the chacham says is not in agreement with their predisposition with their opinion therefore they're allowed to completely destroy it in every way shape or form in order to protect what they believe to be true whether they believe to be true as uh let's say the side of a different rabbi or a different belief or a different custom and so on and so forth and unfortunately many times people put themselves in a very very terrible shape spiritually that ends up hurting them physically and this is actually one of the saddest things that when you see somebody making something and then you you know a kadosh Baruch Hu does something to that person and the person is dumbfounded they don't even realize why why that happened to them and this is actually one of the things that Rabbi Daftaya, Allah Shalom, wrote in his Ruchot uh, Mesaprot, in his Minchat Yehuda, in Parashat Kitavo, that the, uh, the whole uh, uh, issue when it comes to Yirat Shamaim, to the fear of heaven, is of critical value to a person. Why? Because the ultimate goal is to serve Hashem from fear as well as from love. From fear of the Almighty as well as from love of the Almighty. You can't just serve Him from just fear. You can't just for serve him just from love the ultimate goal is if a person gets to the highest level is fear and love of course even rabbi nachman breslov says that the uh even in his generation the vast majority of people are never going to get to love hashem even a little bit because they don't understand what loving hashem really means it's simply simply removing your own personal desires most people think loving hashem just means i say i love you to hashem as long as he gives me my stuff i love him even more that's not loving Hashem. That's loving yourself and your desires and someone that's satiated. So if the Satan gave it to you, you'd love him too. If the Nazis gave it to you, you'd love them too. If, uh, you know, so that's not loving Hashem. Loving Hashem means that you've removed your own personal desires and you've exchanged those, des- those desires with Akadosh Baruch Hu's desires. What he wants is what you want. That's loving Hashem. Of course, most people don't understand what that is. But the reality is that the ultimate goal still needs to be the same, still needs to be aspire to serve Hashem out of fear of the Almighty as well as love the Almighty but even fear and love have levels the lowest level of fear is fear of actual punishment fear of losing money losing people that you love and and health and so on and then there's awe of the Almighty awe of his majesty his glory how great he is how big he is and so on and Rabbi Daftaya says that when a person does not have any fear of the almighty not fear of his awe and his majesty and his glory and how big he is and not even fear of punishment that in itself earns him suffering in this world why so at least after he gets the suffering it increases the likelihood that he'll be afraid of that suffering continuing or getting worse so that in itself can make him more likely to fear Hashem even if it's just fearing for the punishment itself meaning that lack of fear of Hashem is literally putting a, a bomb inside your own house and turning it on that's that's what lack of fear of Hashem is and this is why it's so bizarre when people speak against it and speak against teaching of the Yad Shemayim. it's truly bizarre that uh people haven't realized if you read the Torah it's a it, it's an every page every paragraph every uh every parasha talks about fear of Hashem there's less than a dozen places in the entire Torah to talk about loving Hashem because the fear of Hashem is much, much more necessary. Whereas uh, the, uh, uh, the Gemara in Yerushalmi uh, talks about how you need to, fear, uh, to, to love Hashem because that's going to encourage you to do mitzvot, 
to put on tefillin, to, uh, you know, to, to observe all the different holidays and so on. But the fear of Hashem is going to help you run away from sins. That's why David the Melech said, Su tov. Run away from evil and do good. You have to make sure that you run away from evil because if you do good, but you also do evil, you end up in Gehenom anyway. So the key is to run away from evil. That's where you need fear of heaven, fear that there's going to be punishment for this, but also do good. You have to love Hashem in order to do, do, uh, do good as a result of it. So you need a combination of, of both. But if there has to be a choice of one or the other, it's impossible to get love of Hashem without fearing Hashem. So that in itself is a uh, moot point. The choice is always fear Hashem. So now the Chazoni says that when a person has lackings in this department, they don't fear Hashem. They start thinking negative thoughts, inappropriate thoughts, false thoughts about people. And worse yet, they start thinking about the worst type of people to think about it uh, uh, regarding to, which is the Torah scholars. They start thinking, what's the difference between me and this Torah scholar? So what? He read a few books. So what this? So what that? And they start disrespecting the Torah scholars. And unfortunately, this is quite common. So that in itself, that type of mistreatment of Torah scholars, whether it's the biggest rabbi in the world, or it's an avrech that pretty much only the community knows he exists. He's a Torah scholar, you have to give him special respect. When you don't, you have a very serious problem. Why? You're putting yourself in the category of a heretic, of an apikos. Now, what is the logic of the of this person that's doing that? Says the Chazonish. This person thinks that uh, a the the uh, Torah scholar made an error in Alacha. He made an error. Why? He said one thing, and the uh, the guy thinks that he learned it differently, or he understood it differently when he read the book or when he heard it in the shiul, and he thinks that the Torah scholar has made a mistake. And so, an error in Alacha destroys the entire fabric. For if you believe. It is an established law that there is no sage who is above personal interest. What's wrong with saying that the sage distorted the law because of his personal interest? Isn't it a natural law? If so, the condemnation is taking nothing away from the honor due to the sage. And a person thinking this has poured out the wine and kept the barrel, meaning he discarded the main point while holding on to the minor one. So the Chazonis gives an example where he says this person that he read a book and the Chacham read a book. He watched the shiul and the Chacham learned Torah. He thinks he knows and the Chacham actually knows. And when he said, when the Chacham said something or did something and he doesn't think that that's what he understood. He thinks it's wrong. Automatically he says, nah, this Chacham, he fell on that one. He fell on that one. No, no, I'd say, yeah, he's a chacham. I'm not, dis- I'm not disrespecting him. I'm not disrespecting him. I'm just saying that he's uh, made a mistake. You know, listen, this this is a proof of the Torah that even uh, the, the chachamim make mistakes. You know, the Kwanim made mistakes. They had to bring korbanot. Or he can even tell you, listen, as great as he is, it even says it in the Torah that if you have an interest, you have a bias, you can fall. So you see, this, this chacham, my rabbi over here, they, see, he made a mistake, but that's a proof of the Torah. That he made a mistake, that's a proof of the Torah. I'm showing you how real the Torah is by showing you that my rabbi made a mistake. This is demented logic of the Yetzirah that countless people have in their mind. As soon as their rabbi says something that they don't agree with. That they don't agree with. They're going to say, what? The Chacham is never wrong? That's not what I'm saying. Chacham can be wrong, but it's unlikely that he's, if he's a real Chacham, it's unlikely that you're going to be right and he's going to be wrong. Unlikely. It does happen, but it's unlikely, especially on significant things. I'll give you an example. There was one time, a guy that made a comment, and he said, I don't think that uh, uh, this, uh, uh, um, this Chacham knows what he's doing. He has all types of uh, uh, videos and he has uh, puts music on his videos. And right now, it's the three weeks. And uh, therefore, he's making a mistake. 
don't put music and he makes a public comment or some type of video oh don't put these uh, uh videos with music on them so now what happened you write you respond to this person this is a public uh format uh, a platform first before you go and publicly rebuke something that does not require a public rebuke if you look at the alakot the rambam who gets a public rebuke and who does not this certainly is not it this is certainly not it if somebody speaks in your shul while you're praying first you rebuke them privately if they continue speaking in your shul while you're praying then you rebuke them publicly then you rebuke them in front of everybody else and spill their blood in front of everybody else and it's a mitzvah to do it but if somebody could very well uh, be mistaken even on a minhag on a custom that's not a public rebuke but nonetheless this person found oh wait a minute there's music here it's the three weeks I'm working hard to to to, to count and you're you have music that's terrible so take it easy learn the halacha before you publicly rebuke you're mistaken no I'm not mistaken I'm offended that you even think I'm mistaken this rabotai is sad why because if somebody is giving you a hint if someone's a chacham is giving you a hint that you're mistaken that means they already know you're mistaken it doesn't mean they're not in, they're not hinting you're mistaken to simply just get you off their back they're in essence trying to save your face before you get yourself to be more embarrassed than what you are going to be as a result of it but sometimes a person's ego gets in the way and what ends up happening you have to prove this person that they're literally a little pee on a little pee that's what you take you put it maybe in a soup if you like it in soup you put it maybe in a, on some rice you're a little nothing but you think that you are the the whole world and what that what's that's what ends up happening you end up asking a question you think the chacham is wrong and the chacham is going to open up what he knows and you're going to see do, 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 and you'll see that you're mistaken first of all the halacha is not you're not allowed to the original halacha in the Magen of Ram is not you're not allowed to listen to music it's not allowed to dance but then the achronim says that you know music leads to dance so therefore if it's instrumental music that's live therefore you don't lead the, don't listen to music because that will lead you to dance but even the sages of the of the current generation the previous generation talked about how it's not necessarily all music and even current sages that discussed it and elaborate over it says that there actually are some sages that say it's permitted to have calm music because naturally the calm music is not going to lead to the uh uh the dancing and that's why rabbi tzak yosef uh Shikhye, last year permitted music during this time of the year because people were very down and uh, uh because of the whole coronavirus situation to uplift people last but not least none of that has to do with the music in the videos because the music that they're referring to is music that people could potentially dance to whereas the music in a video that's a commercial that's literally the 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 the, the music that's made as an introduction to introduce a product or to introduce a event no one dances to that the music of a commercial no one dances to the music of a commercial it's just something that's called a melave it's leading the message it's like something like for example when the king comes in they stay blow the horns not because anyone's gonna start saying yeah go king and start break dancing in a in the middle of the aisle because they'll get speared to death if he does that no they blow the horns they make all this noise to tell you something is coming it's a melave the music that the chachamim that refrained from doing and were extremely stringent of was dance music but you thought you found a moom you thought you found a mistake and you wanted to publicly state it to the world because you think that you're smarter than the rabbi unfortunately rabotai when a person does stupid things like this they only find themselves in a deeper hole than what they are why because they're not going to accept the right answer why they're going to go look to see how they can prove the wrong answer right because now it's an ego battle now oh it's a me and you battle it has nothing to do with anything if you actually looked for the truth you would have been able to find it in two seconds but since you were looking to make yourself a name you're never going to find it even if it's staring at you in the face this is important for us to know even more so there are times where people do things because they simply think they're smarter than the rabbi simple i had one time a young man tell me that uh, uh listen you know there is a uh, few people that were coming to the shield they're not coming anymore well, why are they not coming anymore oh, i told them not to come what 
you told them not to come to the shul these same people that started doing tshuva started keeping shabbat started keeping everything you told them not to come why not oh because i talked to another rabbi and the other rabbi says you don't know what you're talking about so i don't know i was talking about the other people and they said oh if he doesn't know what he's talking about then i'm uh, you know then uh, we're not gonna go and i said to myself not only is the person not only is the person murder themselves they also murder other people and they have the audacity to tell you to your face that this is what they did and they think that they're right and they're certain that they're right why because some other mojo told them that uh, they're right now of course this is not a new thing there are always superheroes out there that tell people that they're right no matter what they're doing the chazonish the very same author of this extraordinary sefer when he made aliyah to eretz israel after reviewing a few different places he eventually picked bnei brak bnei brak to live in now in those days when the chazonish moved to bnei brak bnei brak was not what the bnei brak of today bnei brak was primarily comprised of secular people there was not much torah there there i believe there was only one yeshiva there lots of people that were not religious at all there was not much not much torah there and even the people that were observing torah were making major uh, major sins without even being aware of it and one of the things that the chazonish realized is that even the people that called themselves from were making mistakes that made them a mechalel shabbat people that were farming and had cows and so on he saw that they were milking the uh, cows on shabbat the chazonish couldn't believe it he went to them he said you realize you're not allowed to milk the cow on shabbat you're not allowed to milk the cow on shabbat it's chilu shabbat no 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 the rabbi gave me in a tail the rabbi gave what rabbi gave me oh the rabbi he's a rabbi here a long time he, he, the rabbi gave me in a tail because if i didn't milk it enough during the week there's going to be extra milk and because of that if i don't milk it on shabbat the cow is going to be hurt it's it's tzal bal chaim they'll even give him a source tzal bal chaim it's a uh the, the the animal is suffering so the rabbi says you can milk it on shabbat maybe the rabbi said it or maybe you're inventing it but what i can tell you is this that as far as the whole issue of the animal suffering it does not allow you to milk the cow for your benefit if the cow really is suffering then the chazonis told them then you have to milk it but all that milk has to go to the ground complete loss it's not for your benefit that would be desecration on shabbat these people were dumbfounded with come on rabbi maybe you're a little more stringent than our other rabbi and they would argue with the chazonish the gdolado they would argue with them why because they heard it from some other rabbi they heard some other rabbi say that you're allowed to violate shabbat this way because it's for the sake of the animal it's for the sake of the animal and unfortunately rabotai people in the beginning would actually argue it was hard for them to accept it but Baruch Hashem, over time anyone that knows what bnei brak is today versus what bnei brak was 70 years ago you obviously see a world of difference a world of difference but the key is to understand that it wasn't always this way there are always people that got some type of permission from somebody out there sometimes it was a made-up person sometimes it was a real person sometimes the person was a rabbi sometimes he pretended to be a rabbi but nonetheless there are clear mistakes throughout all of the different generations for people that did not investigate for themselves what's the truth because they went to whoever is going to give them what they were looking for rather than what was the truth and many times a person that is not looking for the truth but is simply looking to be right they fall into the trap they fall into the trap of saying listen i have an opinion the rabbi has an opinion what's the difference between us i looked at the book he looked at the book so therefore if i looked at the book and i quoted what i understand and he quoted what he understands that's like two faces out of 70 faces of the torah in essence assuming that you're right assuming that whatever uh uh, uh, uh understanding you have is in uh, line with somebody that dedicates their day and night to learning Torah and the reality is Rabotai Karim it's a very very big mistakes that many fall into it's a big trap that many fall into 
many fall into without realizing it because they simply assume that if they read a book or if they watch the lectures therefore they understand the same way as somebody that does it all the time somebody that does it day and night and even more so somebody that does it for the benefit of others more than himself and it's a very big mistake that people fall into and also it leads them to go and start desiring to study things that they're simply not um they're not uh, fit to study i had one time a guy tell me listen rabbi i appreciate you helped me do tshuva but now i've upgraded i'm uh, I'm, I'm going straight up to the best I said oh what's what's the best exactly maybe i'll go with you oh yeah maybe maybe you can start uh, learning it or teaching it but i'm gonna start learning kabbalah and i'm looking at this guy and i'm thinking to myself aleph bet he doesn't know aleph bet aleph bet gimel dalet hey vav the letters of the alphabet doesn't know praying praying takes him maybe three or four times the amount of time it takes a normal person simply because he's just learning how to see it in in, in in his own personal language in his own first language he doesn't know how to say it forget about hebrew he wants to go learn kabbalah ah, okay let's see maybe he finished the shas no finished half the shas no does he know what the shas is Eh, finish a masechet. Not so much. Okay, maybe he's an expert in halacha. Finish Shukhan Aruch a few times? Not so much. Half the Shukhan Aruch? Not even. One out of the four parts of the Shukhan Aruch. I'm not even sure he knows there's four parts. And you start thinking, what rhyme or reason does, does he have to think that he is a person that can go and learn the mystical aspects of the torah that even torah giants sometimes do not delve into oh because he likes supernatural mystical stuff he likes to say all types of things that he doesn't understand and he likes to talk about how there's upper worlds and it's the bria and it's the this and it's the world of this and it's the world of that and you think it to yourself poor soul it was probably better off for him to stay secular why for sure he's going to lead himself and others astray it's just a matter of time now of course you try to save some of these people you try to convince them otherwise many times you try to do it in a nice way to maybe maybe you could do this maybe you could do that but many times it doesn't work why they have their mind fixated and they think that if you tell them don't study such and such it's because you're jealous I understand it and you don't understand it or maybe you're uh, hugging it you think that you know more you can know more than me forever no I'm gonna go study I'm gonna know more than you they think it's a competition it's really bizarre but this is how it works this is how some people think people think that it's like a competition and they could beat you and they could do this they could do that it's a very very sad reality that you have to deal with sometimes even if they are learning they're literally learning the wrong thing and it was better off for them not to learn at all it's better off for them not to learn at all because many times they are literally making themselves more and more heretical more and more anti-torah and eventually you see these people become completely off completely off somebody that even as a secular person he was actually better off now this unfortunately is something that i've seen a few times and uh it's 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 very painful to see it because it's almost like you're watching the plane crash in slow motion and there's nothing you can do about it there's nothing you can do about it and you know that he's taking whoever is in his family with him whoever is next to him is coming with him the whole thing is crashing and unfortunately this happens unfortunately this happens when people think that they are smarter than what they really are and they don't need the rabbi they don't need anyone they could just read on their own understand on their own lead on their own and they could just jump and hop and be wherever they want to be they are going to be better than everybody else it's all a comp- one big competition unfortunately Rabotai Karim, this is one of the things that will eventually lead this person to not only go in the wrong direction as far as knowledge but also go in the wrong direction as far as their moral behavior because eventually when they see that whatever they came up with 
is not in line with what the rabbis are saying, what the sages are saying, what the Gdolei Adol is saying, they're simply going to assume that their opinion is right and everyone else either is also right, but there's different faces to the Torah and in essence their logic has been an additional uh, a face added to the Torah or they're right and everybody else is wrong. And you see this many times, unfortunately, with people that just jump and do not have anybody to hold them back. They never have a rabbi. They never have anyone that's telling them the truth. And sometimes the only people that they have around them are yes men. People just simply agree with whatever they're going to say because they simply don't want to deal with the headache of disagreeing with this monster. And this happens way too many times with people that do learn, but they simply learn on their own. They learn on their own without any, anybody out there to double check where they stand. And they think they end up, they, because they toil and they work hard, they think that that means that for sure they're going to succeed. They're going to succeed, they're going to understand. They don't realize that the Gemara says, Chavruta o mituta. It's a, it's, if you don't have a Chavruta, it's better off you die. Why? Because who says that you're actually going to be right? Now, they're going to say, no, no, I have a Chavruta. It's a, uh, you know, YouTube. YouTube is a Chavruta. One day I watch this one, one day I watch that one. Unfortunately, even saying good luck to such people is a uh, bitul Torah because it's, it's a waste of blessing. Waste of blessing. Now, the important thing is to know is that when a person gets to a point where they learn how to paskin, they learn how to conclude what is allowed, what's not, what's not allowed, it's not just a matter of memory and remembering all the rules, yes or no. It's also a matter of knowing the rules to paskin. Typically, you see this with converts, Baalei Tshuva, that they lean towards the stringent side. If they have a lot of passion and everything, they lean towards the stringent side. So this is great on one aspect because they want to do everything Hashem says right away. They woke up, they saw the truth, they want to do everything. What do I got to do? Everything, everything. All of a sudden, everything is not allowed. You're not allowed to breathe, not allowed to see, not allowed to eat, not allowed to do anything sometimes. Now, if they have a good rabbi, it can direct them where they're wrong, where they're right, where everything is going. Then, Bezat Hashem, this person could be, uh, could redirect their fire into a good place. The Gemara Masech Chagaz says that if you see that a, uh, a young scholar is fiery, gets a little angry at times, you see that? Don't, uh, don't uh, judge him so harshly. Why? Because right now he's getting this new fire. He doesn't know how to control it yet. But if he's going for the right reason, he'll know how to control that fire. It's going to be a good fire. But if you go too harsh at him, you're going to mislead him into the wrong direction. So if you see a new Baal Tshuva, a new convert, he's fiery and so on, you don't have to uh, 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 rip him up or anything. But, but if this person is one of these rogues, that he's on his own, then you have to do something. You have to try to do whatever you can to save this person before he becomes not a small fire, but a atomic bomb fire. He's going to be a destruction for anything that's next to him. Why? Because this person, as he learns more, he assumes that he's more and more right and the ego continues to build bigger and bigger. So it's important for a person to know that that fire, that fire that they have, that excitement, also has to go in the direction of the Torah and to get to a point of learning how, and being able to paskin, to being able to, to actually know what is the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do, it's not just a matter of memorizing yeses and memorizing noes. You also have to know the rules, the rules of paskining. And the rules of paskining are not necessarily leaning always towards the stringent side. There are times that you have to lean towards the lenient side. But the Gemara in Masech uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah says that if a person always leans to the lenient side of Bet Shammai and the lenient side of Bet uh, Hillel, he is a Rasha. But if he always leans to the stringent side of Bet Shammai and the stringent side of Bet Hillel, he is like a blind fool. You can't lean only to one direction or only to the other direction. What makes a chacham a chacham is to know when to do what to do. When to do what? When to lean right, when to lean left, when to be lenient, when to be stringent. 
there are times that you'll see poskim say that this is what you need to do but if you do otherwise you have something to rely on meaning you can be lenient with this particular halacha if uh, if it's necessary but if you stay stringent an extra blessing will come upon you on the other hand you'll see that some of the poskim will say and it's good to be stringent here in essence they're recommending for you to be stringent but you don't have to be stringent otherwise they'll tell you this is what it is but some post schemes say otherwise meaning we don't agree with this other post scheme we don't agree with them the Allah is a but there are some post scheme that say b why do i need to know if there are some people that are saying b if the Allah is a this is something that you see in books all the time the Allah the Shukhan Aruch says a but he also tells you some say b but we don't paskin like them what value does that have an average person looking at that says i don't know this is like they're wasting ink i don't understand if ink was so expensive why did the uh you know the rabbi yosef caro add all this extra ink telling us that there are some that pask in another way if the Allah is a just tell me a tell me yes tell me no tell me yes tell me no like uh you know like a robot why do I need to know that somebody is paskining against you? What do you want me to go to war with them? You already died 500 years ago. What do you want me to fight him? You want me to go kill his kids? Why do I need to know that he pask in a different way? If the Allah is A and everybody agrees with you except this one, two, three, four, five, six people, the also Chachamim, the also Tzadikim, but they disagree with you. What? You want us to go to war? What's this? What's going on over here? To know that there are rules. What's the rules? If, if we have an Allah an Allah that says we are prohibited from doing something okay we're prohibited from whatever it is I don't want to give you examples and start making people go and start looking things up you're prohibited from doing something but the uh, psak also says but there are some scheme that rule that it's allowed that it's allowed now person will say wait you're not allowed but you're telling me that it's some say it's allowed but we don't listen to them why do i need to know that because the minute they tell you that some post scheme say it's allowed that automatically tells you that you're allowed to benefit from it you're not allowed to do it but you're allowed to benefit from it and this can create a certain value this can create a certain value to a person when it comes to a specific alaha if it's a has to do with fire on yom tov and how it's lit if it has to do with somebody cooking all types of different details when it comes to different alakhot but the key is to know is that the second that you've learned that there's although the alakha is a but some some post scheme say it's b that automatically teaches you that you're not allowed to do it but you're allowed to benefit from it if somebody else did it if somebody else did it whereas there are certain things that you're not you're not allowed to do it and you're not allowed to benefit from it for example if somebody violated shabbat if a jew violated shabbat for your behalf you're not allowed to benefit from it as a fact at the time of the chazonish the chazonish uh found out that the uh the the uh, the electric system was manual in bnei Brak. the electric system was manual in bnei Brak, and there were jews working there but typically on shabbat they would have an arab working there okay so it had to turn on the system so one day the electric system had a problem and the electric system i'm talking about not to turn on lights but the electric system that was used for the water system for the water to come to the houses the electric system had a problem and the jew was not available the uh, arab was not available so they sent the jew the obviously secular jew to go turn on the system and fix it on Shabbat as soon as the Chazonish found out he ran to the uh, synagogues and announced to everybody water in Bnei Brak is not allowed on Shabbat even if that means none of us are going to be able to do Netilat Yadayim before we eat bread not allowed to use the water why because that Jew just violated Shabbat for all of us to get water therefore none of us are allowed to benefit from it not a lot of us are allowed to benefit from it that's what it is if you want to eat bread cover your hands and that's it don't touch the bread that's the way you can eat bread but you're not allowed to wash your hands not allowed to use the water and of course the solution to all of this after Shabbat was that Chazonish 
uh, uh, realized that this is something that could recur, it could happen again. So the only solution was to raise enough money from everybody to go replace the whole system for the city. What the city is supposed to pay for, the community paid for to make it a, uh, a, manu- a uh, automatic system. But the point being is, as soon as a Jew is violating Shabbat for you, you're not allowed to, uh, to benefit from it. Not allowed to benefit from it. But if somebody would have said that some people say it's allowed to do what he did, then you would be allowed to benefit from it. And there are many, many other different intricate rules. When a person reads a book, okay, on his own, He's reading the Rambam on his own. He's reading the Yakut Yosef on his own. He's reading whatever he's reading on his own. Many times he's not going to learn these rules. Why? Because many times the, the, the books that are, uh, that are published today either don't discuss it or he doesn't even know what he's looking at. He doesn't know what he's looking at. He just figures, listen, I'll just read the big script, whatever the small print is, probably is not that important because if it was important, it'll probably be on top. And he doesn't know what he doesn't know. And many times he can miss a lot of the details. And needless to say, you need also a rabbi to teach you a lot of this stuff. So when a person is learning on his own and simply thinks that he can know everything on his own, that eventually can bring him to a point where he starts doubting not just his peers, but people that are much greater than him. Needless to say, much greater than her, much greater than them, and make them think that wait if they're human and they put their pants on one leg at a time and they read books and i read books therefore we're equivalent and there's nothing further from the truth nothing further from the truth but of course this is not something that your average person is going to learn on their own it's just simply something that a person has to uh uh uh, force themselves to to accept by making sure that they realize they know first and foremost before anything else when they're reading a book when they're watching a shiur everything that hashem is sending me right now has to do with me doesn't have to do with the guy behind me doesn't have to do with the guy next to me doesn't have to do with my spouse everything that hashem is bringing to me that's because it has to do with me with me that's why hashem is bringing it to me there's ashkacha pratit there's divine providence of what torah hashem is sending me and therefore, whatever I'm getting, that means it has something to do with me. If Hashem is sending you a bunch of shulim that have to do with anger, that means you have to work on your anger. If Hashem is sending you a bunch of shulim about modesty, that means that you have to work on modesty, and so on and so forth. Now, further, the uh, person that's going to uh, look into, uh, into things and use their logic, many times, their logic will lead them into a place where they simply do not know what's right and what's left and one of the reasons is is because many times a person can only learn certain things once they get further down the the path that they abandoned so for example when a person takes on let's say the 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 strategy of learning gemara is a uh, you know what many you know most of the chachamim throughout history have always recommended is to go to the gemara go one through after another not to uh, spend all of your time energy and efforts on just one page but just simply move on with it now you know of course the daf yomi is an extraordinary uh, uh thing that is brought to the world a person perhaps needs to spend uh, uh, more time on a single daf than just an hour but nonetheless a person needs to you know spend a few hours on the duff and then move on to the next one and to the next one and to the next one and not necessarily uh uh put the you know six months of their life into a single duff because somebody told them that they need to memorize the entire duff this is not the right way this is not the right approach of a uh, uh of learning Gemara. and uh Arab Ephraim wrote about it in his response in a um uh, there's a whole tshuva about it bringing many sources of chachamim that said that this strategy that unfortunately is uh, running rampant in yeshivot today where they tell the kids that they need to simply know these pages back and forth and they'll literally study a single masechet for an entire year or two years or three years with only one masechet under their belt this is a very big problem because many times anyone that has studied gemara realizes that many times you're not going to be able to understand that particular sugya in that particular masechet 
It's in that Masechet, but the answer for it is in a different Masechet. It's not there. It's somewhere else. Part of the answer is where you're at, but a bigger part of the answer is somewhere else, and many times somewhere else is, meaning the Gemara says in Yerushalmi that in one place the Gemara uh, is poor, another place it's rich, meaning that there are different, uh, uh, the, the topics are discussed in different places. In one place, only one line, another place, four lines, another place, 15 lines, another place, six lines. And what a person learns is sugya, they're supposed to learn all of them. But you're not going to go to all the Gemarot at the same time. You finish one Masechet, you go to another Masechet, then another Masechet. Unfortunately, sometimes people say, wait, I'll have my own way. Instead of learning uh, one da for a long period of time, I'll just learn one sugya and I'll learn all of the Masechtot. If you are already at Talmit Chacham and you've covered the Shahs multiple times, and that's the way you want to study by all means. But once a person is just starting out, they just you haven't even finished the shots one time, learning that way is not the right approach. Why? Because you're never going to finish anything. You're never going to finish anything. Now, if a person thinks that he is smarter than everybody else, or he's listening to people that he thinks are smarter than everybody else, unfortunately, this is going to lead that person astray. It's going to lead that person to achieve nothing. And it's simply the Yetzirah trying to destroy him before he started. And that's what the Yetzirah sometimes does, is that he gets to a person with mitzvot he knows that this guy is on fire he knows that he if he's gonna come to him and say violate shabbat that guy he's such on fire he's gonna burn the yetzer eyes no i'm not violating shabbat if he comes there and tells her you know wear a non, non-modest dress or go have a boyfriend she'll burn the yetzer with our kedusha and her zealousness so what does he do the yetzer comes to her with a mitzvah he comes to him with a mitzvah to learn differently than what you're supposed to or differently than what your rabbi said. Why? Because maybe the rabbi that got you to do tshuva or the rabbi that gave you chizuk, maybe that was his only job in the world. But now you need to upgrade. You need a better rabbi. You need a smarter one. You need someone that's older. You need someone that is wiser and can teach you the, the, the secrets of the upper world. And unfortunately, the Yetzirah will lead people astray that way too that way too and at times those rabbis are there to do the job of the satan where they're going to tell the guy listen study this system you're not going to finish the shas anytime soon but you'll know this one masechet really well and what ends up happening maybe they finish that masechet maybe they don't but for sure they end up quitting they end up quitting after a year two years three years five years they end up quitting why because they see listen i just studied one masechet for two or three years and i achieved Okay, one masechet, well, as I see other people studying the daf yomi, and they can at least say they finished the shas. Okay, maybe they don't know the whole shas, maybe they only know uh, the surface, but still, look, they have a sense of achievement. They finished the whole thing. I don't even know what masechet Shabbat looks like. I don't even know what masechet Bamatia looks like. I'm stuck in masechet Tubot, I'm stuck in masechet this one. And a person that studies this way is literally killing himself before he starts. But he was led that way because he thought that he's smarter than his rabbi, that, that got him to get started. So again, it's important to know that there is a way, there is a way to, to, to get to where you need to be, but you always need to have the, the right direction, the right direction. Don't think that there is a shortcut, that you can beat the system, or perhaps that someone is trying to hold you back. Oh, he's... Uh, he's not letting me learn what I want to learn because he probably thinks that I'm going to be a bigger rabbi than him. All types of foolishness are in people's heads. So again, important to know that there is a dot Torah when it comes to that. But of course, if a person does not study Musal, all of what I just said is simply going to go into one ear out the other. Now, when it comes to Musal, most people do not really understand what Musal is. If I ask you, what is Musal? What is Musar? Because the Chazonish says that the Musar teachings are very stringent when it comes to moral corruption. That's how he begins this whole thing. That the Musar teachings are very stringent when it comes to moral corruption and warn against condemning others, even in one's thoughts, and so on and so forth. So now you ask people, what is Musar? He's going to tell you, oh, Musar, that's uh, Mesilat Yesharim, path of the just. Thank you, but no, it's not. Okay, Musar is Chobot Lelabot. I didn't ask you what Musar, what books teach Musa. I asked you what is Musa? What is Musa? He's gonna tell you, oh, it's uh, you know, they teach you how to be a better person. 
That's part of it, but it's not exactly a good definition. So the tradition is, anytime you want to learn what something means, is you go to where it was mentioned in the Torah. In the first place that the word Musal appears in the Torah is in Sefer Dvarim, Parashat Ekev. In the book of Deuteronomy, Parashat Ekev, in chapter uh, 10, I'm sorry, chapter 11, verse 2, Moshe Rabbeinu speaks to the nation, and he says to them, "Ve'adatem ayom ki lo et benechem asher lo yadu ve'asher lo ra'u et musar Adonai Elohim et godlo et yado achazaka uzroa natuya ve'et ototah ve'et ma'asav asher asa betoch Mitzrayim leparo melech Mitzrayim ulekol arzo ve'asher asa lechay Mitzrayim lechay Mitzrayim lesusa ulerchvo vechule." Moshe Rabbeinu says to Am Yisrael, you should know today that it is not your children who did not know and who did not see the chastisement of Hashem, your God, His greatness, His strong hand, and His outstretched arm, His signs and His deeds that He performed in the midst of Egypt to Paov, king of Egypt, and to all His land, and what He did to the army of Egypt, to its horses, and so on. So here we see that the English definition of the word of the word musar is chastisement. That's the uh, that's the English definition. Now, the question is why the Al Shicha Kadosh he comments on this particular pasuk and he says, "What is musar? What's musar?" He says. This is the teachings of fearing God due to his punishment. And we learn that because of what this verse leads to. Meaning, it's not just telling you about the things you saw or the things you heard. But rather, Moshe Rabbeinu is giving us specific examples of what chastisement means because if it's just chastisement of let's say you won't get panasa or Hashem is not going to be happy with you and all types of other things then perhaps some people will understand it some people won't some people will define it one way some people will define it another way but here the Akadosh Baruch Hu is being very clear through Moshe Rabbeinu we have clear instructions what is Musa? And now Sheikh Kadosh says, look what Moshe Rabbeinu is mentioning here. He's saying that you, uh, um, this chastisement is in regards to seeing. Seeing what? Seeing what HaKadosh Baruch Hu did to Paro. Seeing what HaKadosh Baruch Hu did to the army of Egypt. Its horses, its chariots. Seeing what HaKadosh Baruch Hu caused them to perish until this day. Meaning until this day today, you're never going to see any Egyptian that belongs to to the, uh, to the tribe or the lineage of Paro and Egypt from 3,000 years ago, seeing what he did to you when you went against him, seeing what he did to the Tan Ve'aviram, and how HaKadosh Baruch Hu opened the mouth of the world to swallow them, which included Korach, seeing how he swallowed them and their household and all of their fortune. right from under them you saw all of this with your eyes meaning that a kadosh baruch Hu wants you to be afraid of him in fact the gemara says there are certain things that a kadosh baruch Hu did in order for you to be afraid of him for example thunder thunder gemara says why did a kadosh baruch Hu create thunder the reason why a kadosh baruch Hu create thunder is to make you scared of him that's the purpose of thunder here we see Musar what's the point of Musar to be afraid of God because he did all of these big things destructions brought horrors to whoever is his enemy because once a person sees that this is not only something that happened to them but it's also something that could happen to me, 
then that means I already need to be careful with whatever I decide to do. Now, when a person has a real rabbi that they listen to, that they follow, that they simply confirm what steps to take and what steps not to take, that in itself shows that they're afraid of God and that in itself gives their rabbi, the siyat dishmai, the divine assistance, to give them the right answers, to direct them in the right direction. But when a person is not afraid of God, but rather he just wants to be right, he wants to be the all-knowing. So what does he do, or what does she do? She asks questions to Rabbi Google, or she asks questions to Rabbi WhatsApp. There's two different different rabbis today. There used to be one rabbi, the Gdol Ador was Rabbi Google. People would go to Rabbi Google, and they would type in, do, 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 do. what do I do with this? Which, na- which candle is it for Hanukkah? What day does Yom Kippur start? Am I allowed to eat pig if it uh, has a kosher stamp on it? And all types of questions people would type in on Google. Today, they have Rabbi Google, but now there's a new Chacham. Who's that? Rabbi WhatsApp. Why Rabbi WhatsApp? Because, of course, every rabbi out there that is a public personality, every rabbi that has a keila, has WhatsApp, has these, his messaging service, So what do people do? They get different phone numbers for me, for many, many other rabbis. And anytime they have a question, they spam it to all the rabbis that they know. Three, four, five, six rabbis. Whoever answers first, sometimes is the winner, sometimes is not. Why? Because maybe I don't like his answer, so I'll get a different answer from somebody else. So she sends or he sends the questions to a bunch of WhatsApp numbers. And then he decides or she decides which one to listen to. This is a destruction of Torah. Destruction of Torah. Why? You're not supposed to answer, ask questions that way. First and foremost, you have to have your own Rav Muvak. You have to have your own Rabbi. That's number one. Second of all, if there's an issue that your Rabbi is not an expert in, and you need to ask a different Rabbi, usually that other Rabbi should come as a recommendation from your Rabbi. But let's say there's another Rabbi. Your Rabbi already told you, I am an expert in XYZ. If you have issues in regards to, well, let's say, Shlom Bayit or something else, that's not for me or you simply prefer somebody else for that and you want to answer ask somebody else but you want to ask multiple people before you ask the second person you have to get an answer from the first person and then when you ask the second person the second rabbi you have to tell him what answer the first rabbi gave and who he was you can't just whatsapp your questions to 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 whoever and see you which one you pick why that's a destruction of Torah it's a destruction of Torah because number one, it creates confusion. Two, it can create machloket between the rabbis. Three, what ends up happening with a lot of these wicked people say, oh, oh, you say it's not allowed. You know the rabbi over here says it's allowed? It's a piece of garbage, right? Maybe you should go against the rabbi. You want to make a video? What? Who is this guy? What are you talking about? People like to pick fights. They like to get, you know, this guy said it's allowed. You say it's not allowed. Maybe this, maybe that. People want to get you up. This is not the way of Torah. This is not the way of Torah. We're not street fighters. We're not street fighters. Anytime we've talked, anytime any of the Chachamim have talked and have gone against anybody else, it's not because they were uh, uh, going against them personally. It's for the sake of the Torah. Somebody was going against the Torah. Somebody was desecrating the Torah. That's what it's about. But when a person simply decides to make a uh, 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 his, his WhatsApp the new promotion tool for uh, for rabbi boxing matches this is a destruction of the torah destruction so it's important for a person to know where they stand what they're seeking are they seeking the truth are they seeking what's convenient are they seeking the truth are they seeking what's convenient at times a person is going to use their logic and that logic is going to hurt them very much there's a famous story said years ago that uh, there was a guy that was giving, decided to give his ma'asel to the Talmid of the Jose Milublin. Now, uh, this story I heard from Rabbi Ephraim, uh, like I did pretty much everything that I know. Uh, and uh, this guy was giving his ma'asel, his taka, to this Avrech. The Avrech, his rabbi, was the Gdol Ador, the Jose Milublin. And this guy that was giving Maasel saw a lot of bracha in this. He saw as soon as he started giving Maasel to this 
Avrech that nobody knows, aside from knowing that he's the his Talmid, he saw that is he's making more money. He gives him a check for a thousand. He sees that he made fifteen thousand this month. So now he's given fifteen hundred. He made twenty thousand. He sees blessing, blessing, blessing. It's working, Baruch Hashem. One day, uh, he comes to give the maaser to the rabbi, to the avrech, and avrech says, "Listen, next month I'm not going to be here." Uh, so just uh, you know uh, I'm gonna go away for a little while I'll be back you'll give me the master for two months when I come back oh where are you going oh, I'm going to see my rabbi oh you have a rabbi yeah yeah my rabbi Jose Milublin oh you have a rabbi can I come can I see sure you want to come for the trip I'm going for a couple of weeks yeah yeah I'll come with you why not I want to see you want to see your rabbi so they go on a trip they go on a trip this is obviously years ago before planes and and, and so on trains and all that stuff and they go to go see the Jose Milublin as soon as they get there Tavrech goes to see his rabbi and the the guy that came with him the businessman that came with him is in awe why he sees his teacher his rabbi going in he's just like an average like everybody else but the the, the yard the field over there is full of people like him tons and tons of people are waiting online to see the Jose Lublin and he's thinking to himself wait a minute why am I giving my maaser to this avrech I should be giving it to his rabbi to his Jose Lublin why logic is if I'm giving to the to this avrech and I already I'm making profit off of it I'm making a lot of money as a result a lot of blessing of it logic would say that if I give it to his rabbi that has all of these people as his Talmidim all of these people he's helping he's the Gdola though of course I'm gonna get much much more money I'm gonna get much more profit Psh, what a blessing it was that I came here to see this and that's what he decides to do he comes back on his own he goes and sees the Chazemi Lublin and he gives him a couple of months worth of myself just in case to get an extra blessing to make up for lost time and that's what he does he stops giving to the Avrech and he gives it to the Jose Lublin of course the two don't know where from it the Avrech doesn't know where the money is going he does he, when he gets it thank you he doesn't get it doesn't get it but for months he's giving it to him but this businessman sees that every time he gives money to the Jose Lublin he starts losing money he gives him the Marcel at 5,000 he lost money this month he made mo- less money than he did the money before. Okay, so now the master went down to three thousand. He gives him the three thousand. He lost more. Now the master only went down to two thousand. Gives him the two thousand. He sees it's down to five hundred. Losing everything over here. I'm almost at a loss altogether. I don't understand. He comes back to his original avrech, to his original rabbi. And he says, "Listen, rabbi, I don't know what's going on here. I've been giving my master to the gedolado." And uh, I don't know, everything is going upside down. Did you, 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 you learn about this? Do you know why the reason? Davrech had good midot and told him, of course, I learned about this. Of course I learned. No, no, can you tell me? Sure. He says, you don't see the measure for measure here? He says, what measure for measure? What are you talking about? He says, when you gave Marcel to an average avrech that nobody knew about without double checking you just said oh he's an avrech he learns Torah he has a good rabbi that's it you didn't double check anything in Shemaim when that mitzvah went up to Shemaim they said oh he double he doesn't double check who what when how okay don't double check him and his account just give him the blessing give him the blessing what did he give a thousand give him an ability to give two thousand next month he gave two thousand give him more money so he gives four thousand but then when you did check and you said no 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 I don't want to give it to just any of I want to give it to the best I want to give it to the Gdola Do you checked who's the Gdola Do the Jose Milublin so you wanted to go give it to the Jose Milublin the Gdola, Gdola Do I agree is the Gdola Do you agree is the Gdola Do and that's why you checked fine in Shamaim, they also checked said oh, wait a minute who gave this Taka this Marcel oh it's a uh David over here the businessman oh who did he give it to you give it to Jose Lublin how did he get to Jose Lublin 
Oh, no, he checked. Oh, he checked. Let's check. Oh, let's check. What else did he check? Well, did he give it to somebody else? Yeah, he used to give it to his Talmud. Oh, why? He upgraded? Oh, because he wants the best. Okay. Well, you know what? Because he checked, we have to check. Let's check his mitzvot and his account and to see if he is the best person to give the extra panasatu. And after they checked in Shemaim, if you're the best person to give the money to, they decided you're not and they gave it to somebody else. So just like you checked, in Shemaim they checked. When you didn't check, they didn't check in Shemaim. This wasn't a rebuke. It's a reality. And many times, a person will rationalize certain things and make perfect sense to make themselves a road straight to failure. With perfect sense, with perfect rationale, right into Gainom, right into flaw, right into failure. Why? Because the Torah is not necessarily always what makes sense to you. It's not always what makes sense to you. Rabu Vadya, Allah wa Shalom, in his a, uh, extraordinary sefer, Anaf Etz Avot, on page 74, he brings a story in regards to Chachamim and how a person can sometimes not realize what they have right in front of them. And there was a extraordinary young Chacham, an extraordinary young Chacham about 200 years ago named Rabbi Meshulam Igra. This Chacham was already acknowledged as an extraordinary Chacham when he was a young boy. And everybody knew he was a Chacham. And at a uh, young age, 17 years old, this uh, rich person who was a rabbi, doesn't seem like he was such a big Talmud Chacham, but he definitely was a rabbi. He's called a rabbi. Rabbi Shmuel Bik was very rich. And you'll know in a moment why I say he wasn't such a big Chacham. This rich Rabbi Shmuel Bik heard about this young boy, good boy, learns Torah, said, I want it for my daughter. He has one daughter. And uh, you marry her. Fine. They got married. Now, since this Rabbi Shmuel Bik was very, very rich, his daughter was used to being very, very rich. So she used to doing what rich kids do. They go, they wine, they dine, they vacation, they this, they that. She was a rich girl. She wanted to enjoy life. And she wasn't happy that her husband was not really interested in enjoying the scenery and going eating. No, no, he just wanted to learn to learn. That's what he did. And she started complaining and complaining and complaining. And she didn't want to stay married to him. And then she went to her father and complained to her father. I'm not happy with him. He just wants to learn Torah all day. I'm not interested. No, this, it wasn't like that at home. And there, and then, saw this Rabbi Shmuel Bik, heard his daughter, says, you know what? Maybe you don't need such a scholar. Okay, yeah, maybe he's not good for you. We'll get somebody better for you. And he comes to this Chacham, Rabbi Meshulam Igra, and he tells him, listen, I know she's your wife, but she's my daughter. And I'm the one that made the shidduch between you guys. Why don't you, uh, why don't you just stop it? Why don't you just give her a get? Yeah, but I'm married. She's my wife. I don't have to give her a get if I want to stay married to her. Yeah, I understand you don't have to give her a get. But you know that I'm here in this town and everybody knows me. And it's better for you to just leave. It's better for you to let her go. Give her a get. And despite his sadness and not wanting to give her a get, he knew that his Torah, with time, could fix this marriage. Torah can fix anything. But with all this pressure, he let her go. He gave her a get. And now, shortly after, there was a big question having to do with the issue, Allah's having to do with marriage and divorce and so on, the different poskim were discussing because the Gdola Dor at the time, Rabbi Yeshaya Berlin of Breslev. Rabbi Yeshaya Berlin, he was looking for different opinions about a specific big topic. 
regarding Gitin and so on. And different Chachamim from all over the world sent them their responses and their sources and so on. It's a big honor to send your, uh, your information, your uh, best work to the Gdol Adok if he's, if he's going to read it. He's going to use it potentially in his next book and so on. So one of the, out of the many different chuvot that Rabbi Yeshaya of Berlin saw, one stood out. One stood out above everybody else. Chachamim from all over the world, big wise men that were older, toiled in Torah their whole life, but yet this one Chacham he's never heard of sent an answer and he was baffled. How did I never hear about this Chacham? Who is this Chacham? And he sees that it's written on it, Meshulam Igra of Brody. He asks people, do you know who this Meshulam Igra is? Nobody knows. So we need to find somebody from Brody to tell us who this Chacham is. This must be the, the rabbi of the city. I never heard of him. As you would have it, as he's looking at this answer, this Rab Shmuel of Bik, the former father-in-law of uh, Rav uh, Meshulam Igra of Brody, he walks into his Bet Midrash. Ah, oh, Rav Shaya knows him. His old friend he goes, Hey, how are you, my dear friend? How you doing? Ta -ta -ta. He's like, Listen, I, it's Mama Siyati Dishmaya that you're here in my Bet Midrash because I'm looking for somebody from your city. Why do you need some, somebody from my city? Do you know, I do, can you tell me more about this Chacham? That you guys have and merited to have in your city this 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 Rabbi uh, Meshulam Igra of the uh, the Shmuel Bik Rabbi Shmuel Bik the big Chacham he's just a seventeen year old kid there are a lot of Chachamim in Brody well what's so different as soon as he said this the Gdol Ados face changed what you are comparing this Chacham to anybody else? Do you not realize that you have the Gdol Ador in your hands? As soon as he said this, this Rav Shmuel Bik fainted, fell down and fainted. Now, Rav Ishaya has no idea what, what happened. What did I say? They got him up. He says, what happened to you? Why did you faint? He says, you're saying he's the Gdol Ador? So of course he's the Gdol Ador. What do you mean? He says, this young man was married to my daughter and I forced him to divorce her because he was studying too much Torah. Rabbi Yeshaya says to him, it's better for you to faint again when you just had the Shekhinah itself inside your house and you let it out. It's better for you to faint again. Sometimes a person's logic is going to lead him to the wrong direction. In such a f wide, such a wide mark, so, so far away from where the destination is, that literally, when they realize how wrong they are, they'll faint from embarrassment. The way to save our face, the way to save ourselves from such unnecessary hardship that we bring ourselves is always to trust in da Torah not our opinion but da Torah according to the Chachamim and that Chacham has to be your Rabbi not just a Rabbi but your Rabbi because so long as you are your own Rabbi that means that you are morally bankrupt because if you do not have the ability to get yourself a rabbi that you're going to learn everything from, that you're going to comply with, that means that the deficiency is not in the rabbis. Because surely there has to be a chacham out there that can help you, that can lead you. But if you simply think that no one is good enough for you, that means that the deficiency is in you. That means that when you're watching the shiur, and you're hearing about problems, you think that Hashem is sending you messages to talk about everybody else because everyone else is missing something. And it's quite the opposite. 
the message that Hashem sends each and every single one of us is to us is to us and it's important for a person to look at the world from that perspective because so long as a person looks at things from that perspective surely that's going to lead to more humility surely that's going to lead them to get to more likely to have the right answer surely that's going to lead them to do be more willing to do the will of Hashem and if you're doing the will of Hashem surely HaKadosh Baruch Hu will help you get to the best possible de- destination Bezat Hashem this too will give us the right chizuk that we need in our time to help ourselves get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, swallowing our pride simply begging a kadosh bahu to send us clarity through the right places and that way we'll know that we're going in the right place and enjoy the ride all the way there amen